They've fallen from cliffs they could not have climbed, vanished without a sound right behind their mother, disappeared into thin air, and been found mountain ranges away from their last location. National parks have some unique and dangerous animals, but also some unique and dangerous people, with legends telling of unknown creatures lurking among the tree lines. These stories are unique, but not unheard of. There are some 1,600 cases of people going missing in America's national parks under extremely mysterious and unexplainable circumstances. These collections of stories are known by some as the Missing 411. July 23rd, 2015. A day before his 19th birthday, Joseph Lloyd Keller would embark on a simple two and a half mile jog inside the Rio Grande National Forest with his friend Colin Gowaltney. Their path was simple, running from the nearby Rainbow Trout Ranch where they were staying, down Forest Service Road 250, and ending at the three mile marker before returning to the ranch. At the one mile mark, they were spotted by a female wrangler. After about a mile and a half, the two naturally separated due to Colin's faster pacing. And later, at the two and a half mile marker, a fly fisherman saw Colin, but didn't see Joe anywhere. One hour after finishing his run, Colin would call law enforcement to search for his missing friend. Joe's disappearance didn't make much sense, and it puzzled investigators. The path they were on was easy to follow, and hard to get lost on. The impassable objects on both sides made escaping the Forest Service Road borderline impossible. To the right, a large canyon wall that was too steep for even the most skilled climbers to ascend. And to the left, a large sweeping river to prevent anyone from crossing onto the wrong side. Despite the search effort that police put together, as the hours ticked by into the morning of July 24th, Joe was still missing. A very physically capable runner had seemingly walked off the earth. Even with the obstacles on both sides of the Forest Service Road, nobody could see or hear him. After the police became aware of Joe's disappearance, 200 volunteers and 15 dogs combed through Colorado's mountainside to search for Joe and hope for his safe return home. However, after several days of searching with no results, the search slowly faded until 13 days later when it was finally called off. Even with the desperate pleas from Joe's family, a formal search was never again resumed. Despite this, Joe's family would search for him as often as they could, recruiting whoever was able and willing to join them in the search for their lost son. The search continued for one year, until July 6, 2016, when John Ryanstra, a search and rescue hobbyist and former offensive lineman for the Pittsburgh Steelers, would make an unsettling discovery. After traversing the Forest Service Road for two and a half miles, there's a natural turnoff point in the road where one could park a car. John followed this turn towards the massive cliffs and then followed the cliffs northwest. Once he reached the end of the cliff face, John did a 180 and followed the canyon wall back towards the ranch where he discovered Joe's body. The body was in such a remote location that searchers had to carry the remains out on foot as the terrain was too rugged for horses or dogs to continue. He was found only 1.7 miles from the ranch and one mile from the Forest Service Road and was within a few hundred yards of a search that happened back in November of 2015. But that's not where this story ends. In reality, it's where it kind of begins. The coroner found that Joe's cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head along with a broken ankle. How? The most likely answer is a fall from the top of the canyon or a fall while scaling the side of the canyon's walls. Regardless, this behavior is far from normal. Why would Joe divert from the standard Forest Service Road without telling anyone? Why did he try to climb such a steep and tall canyon wall? What caused him to not turn around towards the original road? If he fell from the top, how was he able to traverse the steep walls? There's no clear path from the Forest Service Road to the top of the mountains through a non-rock climbing route. The 411 cases follow a pattern. A person will go missing, usually with an eyesight of the last person that have seen them or within a few hundred yards of where they were last seen. After a quick amateur search attempt, the person will be declared missing by local police, and then, despite a massive search effort by search and rescue, they will never be seen or heard from again. Or, they will be found in an unfathomable distance from their starting location. There are a lot of cases that match this description. The partially deaf six-year-old Larry Jeffrey was with his two stepbrothers when he disappeared near the peak of the 12,000-foot Mount Charleston near Las Vegas. The search for the child was almost immediate, with searchers able to find and lose the trail in the snow a few times. They discovered he had been eating insects and berries to sustain himself, but after this, he simply vanished into thin air. His tracks completely disappeared. 
After 16 days of searching and 1,000 volunteers, he's still missing today. According to local records, there were no predators afoot that day, and the secluded area ensures that there were no abductions that could have occurred. Six-year-old Dennis Martin. Dennis was hiding in the bushes next to his brother in order to prank his parents, but when it came time for the surprise, Dennis was missing. After a rainstorm washed away any potential tracks, the boy was never found despite the largest search in National Park history. Despite these mostly normal circumstances, there was a report of a family allegedly seeing a bear man running with something slung over his shoulder that appeared to look like a small child. The couple who reported this described the bear man as closer to that of a feral human than that of a bear on its hind legs. There are some cases that have more resolution, but that resolution leads to more questions. In 2009, the nine-year-old David Gonzalez asked his mom for the keys to get a treat from their car that was some 50 yards from their campsite in the San Bernardino National Forest. After she saw David a few feet from the car, she looked back towards the lake. A few moments later, however, she turns back and does not see any sign of David. She then checks the car. No sign of David and his treats are still inside, meaning he never got into the car. This means he disappeared without making a sound. Shortly after this, his mother would describe seeing a beige pickup truck speeding away from the campground parking lot. However, because of this, no noises or signs of abduction, this lead was not followed up on. A year later, however, the remains of David were found about a mile away from the campsite that the family was at. The official reasoning was a mountain lion attack. However, the lack of noise, struggle, or blood makes this explanation harder to believe. Any extra marks that were found on the boy were determined to have come from scavenging animals, so no cause of death was able to be determined. In April of 2017, 22-year-old Jacob Gray was on a mountain bike ride during a rainstorm in Olympic National Park in Washington State. After a few days, passerbys and park rangers would find his bike inside of a tarp formation on the side of the road as if to be some form of shelter. The bike was found in good condition with most of his supplies still there. After days of searching, they found his sister's phone number in his things, and then soon after, the family filed a missing persons report and the official search began. Due to staffing and resource issues, the Olympic National Park was not able to offer a large search effort, and the snow a thousand feet above his belongings made it look like he was either at or below 2,000 feet in elevation. Because of the snow at 2,000 feet and the nearby river, the immediate conclusion was that Jacob went to get water by the nearby river and was swept away before succumbing to hypothermia or drowning. A year later, however, while on a biologist trip to study local marmots, Jacob's body was found. Not below 2,000 feet, but above it, at nearly 5,300 feet in elevation. His body was also 15 miles from where his bike was found. His actions appeared to make no sense whatsoever. While in a rainstorm, Jacob apparently pulled over, created a camp, and walked 15 miles in the snow to a ridgeline where he eventually succumbed to hypothermia. The logical pieces did not add up. Even if he was going to search for water or some form of shelter, as soon as he ran into snow, the logical thing would be to turn back towards the more appealing landscape below the 2,000 foot line. These disappearances defy all conventional logic and wisdom. Why would anyone climb a cliff at 11,000 feet in Colorado while on a run? Why didn't that little boy make a noise when he was taken? Why did Jacob hike 15 miles to a remote overview of Ho Lake? Few know the true answers. However, many have claimed to tell of a much more supernatural explanation. These stories are all a part of what's known as the Missing 411, an arbitrary collection of missing persons cases that are deemed unexplainable and mysterious by its founder, David Pilates. I don't know if that's actually how his name is pronounced, but it looks similar, so I'm just gonna go with that one. David is an avid cryptozoologist, which is someone who studies the unknown, but not in an academic way. He has published several books and two full-length documentaries about these strange disappearances and alleged creatures that he claims the national parks are hiding due to their negligent incompetence to track the missing people. And he is part correct, part incorrect. The national parks are not required to maintain a list of those persons who go missing in the parks, and many who do still use paper systems as the current digital database is described as hell on earth to use and maintain. So yes, they do not all keep centralized databases and some do not keep even paper records. This is because jurisdiction can often be complicated. Occasionally, the parks will handle the search, other times it's the county, and rarely the state or federal government will step in to search for the missing individuals. What 
often smells like conspiracy is more likely incompetence or poor funding or poor resources. The other flaw with the general factor of how the missing 411 cases are classified is the arbitrary nature that they use to determine if a missing person's case qualifies for the 411 catalog. While it may seem as if this is a hit job on the 411 team, their documentaries are very well done and they do not feed into the overly conspiratorial edge that many of the shows like Ghost Adventures or Ancient Aliens do. But then the questions still remain. What's the cause of all of this strange behavior? Since the missing persons cases are very broad, we can also use very broad human psychology to try to understand the behavior that made some of these people make their bizarre decisions. First, persons who are lost or believe that they are lost often default to going to higher ground. This can be to try to find landmarks to make their way back to where they were, or to simply be more visible to searchers if it comes to that. This can partially make sense as to why Joe Keller might have wandered towards and attempted to go up the canyon wall. He may have been trying to find the direction of the cabin by climbing a short distance up the wall, falling on his head and breaking his ankle on the descent. As for why he was taken off the path, theories range from an animal sighting or animal scare all the way to delirium from the altitude that they were at. Joe Kelly had a history of asthma, and this could have combined to dilute his reasoning and sense of direction. Second, there are the cases of the children who were either likely abducted by animals or adults and never found again. There are also a few cases where the kid could have become disoriented by the vast wilderness and wandered off into some obscure area of the park. Lastly, there's the case of Jacob Gray. While the distance he traveled was rather large, there's a sad theory pioneered by PhD Robert Coaster. He states that children will often go up, so people have a vision quest. Depending on the message that they believe they have gotten, I have seen some of them climb mountains. The idea posits that this bike ride may have been meant to be his last. However, if it was, the reasoning for the leftover gear and equipment is strange. He either decided to climb into the Olympics and be at peace before he succumbed to the elements, or on a trek for water became delirious to where he was disoriented and managed to wander 15 miles until eventually succumbing to the elements. Regardless of the reasonings, to me they're more understandable than the cannibalistic human creatures, Bigfoot, or UFOs that are posited by some of the 411 community. Humans can be reasonable, but not always. National parks offer the most wonderful curse. Their expansive and remote landscape can create a euphoric sense of wonder and inspiration, or they create confusion and delirium. Those that wander, by choice or accident, are cursed by the same elements that make them wonderful. And while there are plenty of instances of humans acting irrationally, there are even fewer instances of photographed monsters abducting those that step onto their lands. There are those that seek it and those who find it. But regardless, I hope all the souls who ended up in these parks are able to find that peace one last time.